Okay, and welcome everyone to this webinar presenting the whole of Syria Food Security Sector Outcome Monitoring Initiative. My name is Vikman, I'm the Global Assessment Coordinator for Impact Initiatives, and I will facilitate the session today. Today's webinar will last for an hour, an hour and a half. We have three presentations followed by a Q&A. The uh, speaker today will introduce us to the whole of Syria cluster coordination. We have Samad Chasarar, the uh, coordinator for the whole of Syria food security sector. She has over 14 years of humanitarian experience, particularly in pro program designing, implementation, and coordination. She has created with Syria operations since 2013, setting up the cluster in South Turkey, Jordan, and the whole of Syria. She also worked with Global Food Security Cluster for two years with particular focus on submissions and program quality. Barbara Nort is the co-coordinator co for the whole of Syria food security sector since October 2016. Um, I will just uh, clean in there and advise everybody who is joining the call to please uh, mute your microphone. Uh, so Barbara Bissonnold, she has worked on Syria pre-crisis and the human rights and humanitarian sector since 2011, notably as a program analyst for um, the cross-border operations in Lebanon and more recently as the INGO coordinator for the cross-border operations in Iraq. We're also going to have a presentation of the Outcome Monitoring Initiative um, itself. It will be presented by Anne-Marie Cunningham, joined the whole of Syria food security sector in 2016, and created the Outcome Monitoring Initiative. Humanitarian sector since 2002, with a focus on M&E in the food and livelihood sector, as, as complementary areas. She has previous experience in the cluster with WFP, and has worked also for IFRC, UNHCR, and UNDP. We're also joined by Alekan, who joined the whole of Syria food security sector in January 2017 as monitoring and reporting officer based in Amman. He has 12 years of experience in emergency humanitarian operations, including in Darfur, Zimbabwe, and Syria. Yeah. Previously, Alekan worked as monitoring and evaluation officer for WFP in Syria. Finally, we'll have a partner presentation from International Relief and Development, IRD. Arba Heher is the Monitoring and Evaluation Specialist working for International Relief and Development based in Jordan since December 2014. She is responsible for monitoring of food assistance distributions from two ID donors, Food for Peace and WFP. She is also responsible for monitoring of other IRD activities, including the non-food support from OTA and UNHCR, Washer Keys and Quick Impact Project. A few minutes before I turn over to Samantha, you are all very welcome to submit questions during the presentation. Please send them to us via the chat on your webinar application. During the Q&A, we'll get to as many of those as we can. All as just mentioned, please mute your microphones when you're not speaking. And I will hand over to Samantha and Barbara. Can you hear me? Can I just make a do a sound check? Yes. Okay. So thank you very much for the introduction. Um, before we get into the presentation of of the outcome monitoring initiative, um, I would like to give a bit of background on the whole of Syria food security sector. Um, and also the rationale and uh, and uh, the the objectives behind this initiative. Uh, and uh, right after I provide that information, my colleague will complement that with some um, other observations. Um, so I would like to um, just clarify for the benefit of those who are not very familiar with whole of Syria. Um, all of Syria is a, is a very complex uh, response um, as well as coordination system. Um, it is um, basically coordinating all activities uh, of the humanitarian response plan that goes on 
uh, in Syria from um, three formal hubs. Um, so there is a hub in Syria based in Damascus under the humanitarian country team there. And uh, there are two more formal hubs, one based in South Turkey in Gaziantep and the other based in Jordan in Amman. The, uh, the last two formal hubs are the cross-border hubs, which are under the UN uh, resolution that, um, uh, that allowed cross-border uh, work in the opposition country areas uh, since 2014. Uh, some of you may know that uh, Syria was declared a level three emergency in December 2012. And in uh, January 2013, we set up a sector coordination because cloud was not fully activated. It was activated for logistics and ETC. So the rest of the um, uh, clusters are called sectors. Um, so we set up a sector working group in Damascus. Um, and uh, then that was followed by a search mission from um, some global food security cluster that I was part of in the month of May uh, to with NGOs that were working mostly in the northern parts of Syria and opposition controlled areas. So we set up a, a food security uh, and livelihood sector working group in South Turkey in um, June 2013. And that that enabled us to gather a lot of evidence around needs and response in um, in parts um, of the country where they are not able to reach because of the lack of uh, the resolution. Um, finally, when the UN resolution came into effect, um, um, as you as I said earlier, um, United Nations. Uh, started its operation from um, both South Turkey and Jordan into uh, different parts of Syria as well. Um, and then in 2014, uh, uh, 2014, we also laid out the whole of Syria approach, which involves coordinating these three uh, formal hubs under a single um, umbrella to have um, uh, a consistent approach on needs, response gaps, technical guidelines. Um, uh, monitoring, assessment, indicators, response packages, selection criteria, so on and so forth. Uh, so finally, um, in April 2015, uh, we are fully functional as the whole of Syria the security sector. Um, and, uh, and sorry, there's a lot of background noise, so I'm just pausing for a bit. If, if you please mute your microphone. Thank you. So, um, uh, so in 2015 April, we set up the whole of Syria food security sector as a fully functional group. And um, uh, as globally, it is led by WFP and FAO, so was the case for whole of Syria. And we're complemented by Marcy Corp as our NGO co chair. Um, and in the hubs in uh, South Turkey and Jordan, um, we also have NGO co chairs. So in South Turkey, we had GOL um, as our NGO co-chair, which just stepped down recently, and now we have Catholic Relief Services. And in Jordan, uh, International Relief and Development, or IRD, is our NGO co-chair. We all um, coordinate with two formal hubs that are mostly, uh, you know, NGO, I mean, primarily NGOs, because those don't come under the UN resolution. So the two informal hubs are, are from um, from Iraq uh, into Hassan, which are the North East Syrian NGOs. Many who are actually based in Hassan, and so partners who operate from Lebanon. And Barbara um, has a very specific role of uh, coordinating with these two informal uh, these two informal hubs. So now, um, uh, uh, now that view on the structure, um, I would like to get into the main thing of the part of this uh, webinar, which is the Outcome Indicators Monitoring Initiative. Uh, uh, for the first time that we had a whole of Syria Human Response Plan uh, and um, in that plan, we already had to work very hard to bring 
uh, partners from three hubs under one umbrella. Um, and uh, that plan focused mostly on output-related indicators, meaning that we're reporting on metric tons, number of people reached, um, etc. cetera, on, on, and it was mostly number crunching. Um, so in 2016, when we held our consultation for the uh, food security sector uh, chapter for the humanitarian response plan, um, we had a lot of feedback from partners uh, from across all hubs, whether UN agencies or international or Syrian NGOs, to looking beyond output level indicators to start reporting on outcome level indicators. And we, as the sector secretariat, as the sector coordinators, we took that very seriously because we felt the need that five years into the conflict, we really needed to report more on the qualitative analysis on how the um, a huge uh, number of people being reached are actually benefiting from uh, from the assistance that's been provided. We were very mindful that in, in the context of Syria, the various uh, tools for accountability to affected population uh, were not being applied fully. So that this outcome indicators monitoring um, exercise would give us a solid evidence and um, uh, you know, provide us a good linkage with accountability to affected population, um, and uh, and would let us speak in one voice as a collective sector, cutting through hubs, cutting through United Nations, international NGOs, or Syrian NGO divides, um, and bring out the evidence uh, through a single post distribution monitoring, which is why we uh, launched this initiative. And um, you will learn more about it, more about the nitty gritties on, on processes, the findings, the good practices, and our plans for 2017 from the presentation from uh, Alikan and Anbari. So I will stop here and uh, I will invite Barbara to, to complement uh, my overview. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sam. Um, I think you've covered uh, pretty much uh, uh, the overall background and structure and, and the summary of the, um, the the outcome monitoring initiative very well. So I'm not going to add much um, except the fact that it was a very, very unique exercise. And as you mentioned, uh, it proved that um, uh, with enough, uh, energy and willingness and, of course, you know, commitment, uh, outcome monitoring can actually be uh, taking place inside Syria because it's clearly what has been missing within this overall humanitarian uh, response uh, that has been going on for nearly six years now um, in order to try to, to look at how much uh, different actors and different sectors have been uh, performing based on, on specific humanitarian response plans. Uh, so I think that was yeah exactly what you mentioned and I, I think the only the other thing that I want Wanted to stress on was uh, through this exercise that Alcan and Anne Marina will will introduce to to all of you. Um, it really showed how it was uh, possible to have everyone uh, across different hubs and regardless of uh, agency or the institution within which uh, the partners are working. Closely there. And um, as you mentioned, the two other informal hubs, uh, I know there are a lot of applicants for uh, taking part in the initiative next year, I mean, uh, throughout this year. So we're very much hoping that uh, next year, both Iraq and Lebanon hub uh, will, will be taking Okay, we've lost uh, Barbara. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, you're back. Yes, yes, you're back. I don't know. I don't know where I left you. I was just uh, I was just complimenting very briefly what Samantha said. 
Um, and and I ended up, I don't know if you heard that, that we were very, very, uh, like, strongly hoping and encouraging, and we know that there's appetite from um, our two other informal hubs uh, to take part in this initiative this year. Uh, so we are, we're very happy about that. And I think now it's it's good to have a can and I'm already seeing the the oral initiative, the processes, uh, the lessons learned, and how it 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 meet up with uh, this very interesting information. Over. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is Anne-Marie Cantier. So I'm going to um, introduce the first part of the presentation. Um, and for the sake of flow, I'm going to present what we see the... We do pro Properly. Anne Marie, it's the um, the sound, your microphone. How is it now? It's a little bit better. But be closer, please. I'm holding microphone right at my mouth. Is is that better? Okay, that is better. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Please let me know as well. Um so I'm the presentation um for the sake of flow, almost to the end where I really can with Wayne in and um discuss the, the way forward. And um, one second, I'm just checking. I can change the the slides because I've just been enabled, or maybe it will help on how to 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 change the slide if somebody could assist. They don't seem to be changing for me. You should either use the arrows at the top or um, even the arrows on your keyboard up and down. I tried both. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to to work. I'll ask you to turn your slide. I now, I can. I have it. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Can you see them changing? Yes. Okay. Okay. So we're just on the agenda, um, the speakers. I think all of that has been introduced. So I'm just going to start from here. Thank you. Patience with that. Um, so in terms of this presentation, what we're going to speak about, we're just going to a little bit about um, the background and rationale, so why this outcome on initiative was, was undertaken. I think Sam and Barbara have already um, introduced that to some extent. And then we look at the, um, the indicators that were used, that we measured, and um, the data collection itself, the data collection processes, the methodology, so how we, we did that component, how we coordinated the data analysis and how the analysis itself was conducted. And of course, what were the role of the partners in this exercise and what was the role of the sector itself? the staff of the actual sector because it really was a joint process. So what were the different roles and responsibilities? And then we will say a little bit about the also the way forward um, for this whole of Syria initiative. Some key sort of things that we thought might be useful for, for you, if you have people working in other countries and other sectors. Or sorry, in other in other clusters in other countries. And um, to um to replicate the, the process or to do the do something similar. Um, Sam um, talked us through um, in terms of the, the whole of Syria had the you know food security sector humanitarian response plan and its own specific objectives. And a lot of work and great progress was made in terms of collecting data and analyzing data and coordination at the output level. So in terms of who was um, doing what where and, and what the gaps were and uh, coordinating that whole task. So then this is moved to the outcome level and look at essentially what are the effects of the assistance at the household level. And only assistance, also what is the current status of beneficiary households, so households across Syria and people across Syria doing with regard to um, food and livelihood security. And of course, being a, a cluster mechanism, we wanted to identify what the gaps were in areas of concern and, of course, go that next step then to see what can be done about it. And, and there's just a noise there. Is that okay? Okay, yeah. To collectively utilize this data to inform programming and sector support. And I think to collectively look at things is, is really key. It was The idea was to enhance how... Um, Dig actively to improve programming. Um, of course, as a second objective, we wanted to enhance and harmonize the capacity for, for monitoring and evaluation for partners working in the sector. 
There's many partners working um, in the course of Syria and in the different hubs. Some partners have been working in the, the area for a long time and are familiar with monitoring and evaluation of the various management aspects of programming, and there's not so much. So it was very, there was varying levels of, um, and we wanted to see how we could sort of assist with that as well to um, you know, standardize or have some sort of minimum set of indicators and minimum requirements. And for the new organizations as well, by providing you know, a set of indicators, a data collection tool and some analysis training, it's almost like providing the whole package, with, or a, a, well, a package which each partner can build upon as they see, see fit or integrate into their existing program as they see fit. And um, this was the first time such a, a monitoring exercise had been done collectively, so it can also act as a baseline for, for future monitoring of the results that we found. Um, I'll speak about that. I'll speak about that a little bit later, later on. Um, in terms of advocacy, of course. So how are we going to use this information um, to commission and, and to uh, enable us to better um, form donors and on our programming and what sort of support we can. And again, I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit later in terms of the, the report. Um, so then, just tell you a little bit about um, the indicators actually used and other um, key factors that we mainstreamed into the, the system. So um, four uh, indicators, there was the food consumption score, the household dietary diversity score, and the reducer food-based coping strategies index, as well as the livelihood coping strategies index. And I think familiar with the fact that the first three are actually standardized um, indicators and modules, questionnaire modules. So, um, whereas the livelihood coping strategies indicator, we actually contextualized. We worked with partners in all of the three hubs that participated to identify key livelihood coping strategies, which we wanted to incorporate into the um, questionnaire and came up with a, a set of 10 that everybody in each of the three hubs broadly uh, agreed upon. Into mainstreaming gender protection, what we was the right, uh, the approach at the, the right approach at the time for the food and livelihood sector was to incorporate um, was to aggregate all of the four indicators that I mentioned by the gender of the head of household. So for male and female diff headed households have different dynamics, different um, needs also, and different stresses at times. So we wanted to see um, how uh, what the food security situation and livelihood situation in each of the bits of households and then how best we could look at that programmatically. Then in with coping strategies as well, we were also cognizant of incorporating gender and, li and, and protection concerns into those livelihood coping strategies. And key, um, three key um, coping that were identified uh, which are pertinent to this area was um, children working and particularly less than children than 16 years old. Um, the marriage of young girls um, less than 16 years old in order to ease the financial um, years old was so here there was uh, we had some discussion on it uh, with four partners because in areas of Syria it might be something that could be quite could happen or normal circumstances that girls 16 years old um, or older may um, marry at that age um, so what we were looking for was to identify when a family is really under stress when it comes to food and livelihood um, situation. Um, we all looked at um, undertaking high risk and exploitative work, and this was then age disaggregated. And when asking the questions, we were also um, careful to say um, that this was a, a strategy that the household used in order to meet the food or the basic needs of the family. So again, separating it from something that might have happened for a different reason. Into the data collection itself, just to give you an idea of how it went, we uh, collected um, uh, data, and there were some partners involved in the three different hubs, um, as Sam and Barbara mentioned. So there were um, we were collecting with partners in Damascus, in uh, and also from um, South Turkey hubs. Um, so uh, information was collected from a. 11,700 um, households in 13 government reports. And what we had was a data collection window. Data was collected between um, the beginning of September and the end of December um, 2016. 
So here it gives you the idea of um, where the data was collected from and the concentration of, um, of household use. And just to be aware that this is not uh, this map is representative of the 17 organisations that participate, so it's not representative of benefits in all of the governors or all the districts that receive assistance, or it's not representative of need. It is just representative of um, where we actually manage to do the data collection itself. So just to give you an idea of the key findings also uh, from data collection itself, just in terms of how the situation is for beneficiaries in Syria at, at present or at the end of um, in the last quarter of 2016. So support from um, all of the partners and the, the sectors helped to stabilize the of assisted households. So it escalated in, in, in many areas and of course it has uh, gone on in time. Markets have changed, stabilized, increased. Um, so all of the internal factors have worsened, but the consumption has at least um, stabilized to some extent. Um, however, there are beneficiary households only, of course, just to, to make that. However, given the situation, there are still huge needs, and um, 7% of households had inadequate food consumption, 4% had inadequate dietary diversity. The strategies for beneficiary households is very high, 15.7. And 2% of surveyed households were producing emergency and crisis survival strategies to meet their big um, food needs. See how uh, uh, this information um, is very important to convey to everybody working in the sector. Um, I know I could say before, but it's, yeah. So there was a thing. In terms then of the, the process. Some methodology. So, just to explain to you a little bit about how we went about this, how we engaged with partners, and how we all worked together as a collective to do this exercise. And this so, um, by, with hub level consultation. So, we went to each of the, the three different hubs and explained why we wanted to do this and um, what process would be, what the expectation, the roles and responsibilities, etc., would be. And at these consultations as well, we also um, worked on contextualizing uh, the livelihood coping strategies um, list of strategies. We'll go into the livelihood um, coping strategies indicator. And this then, this was like a general uh, like afternoon or morning uh, consultation with all partners. We also went and we met with um, individual um, partners and discussed specifically um, with them what their concerns would be. And how they would how they would engage, what sort of issues, where they were with their own monitoring and evaluation, how they felt this could feed into the, their own process, and etc. And it, just to read, uh, how we presented it as well, the different roles um, of the club itself, or the sector itself, and the roles of partners. So, for example, in the roles of the the sector, what would take the consultations to adapt and contextualize the tools and make that one tool specific for the whole area. We were provided the required tools, tools in the required format. So we had paper questionnaires, ODK, um, and then, importantly, of course, we translated to to Arabic. And things on data collection and analysis, and we'll speak a little bit later. But what's important here as well is that, of course, we trained in Arabic on the data collection tool. Um, the sector itself pre did the analysis at the national hub level, um, so of the information. And did the analysis as well. So the role of the um, was actually the data collection itself, and then to send the data to the sector for COBA national analysis. And so we provided a common platform and then standardized templates also for people to, to send the data, depending on which modality they were going to use. And what's critical here and what's, what's critical uh, for your context is that uh, the data was all an anonymized. It's only the, the staff at the sector who could who knew who was sending in, in the data and where people are working. Everything was presented collectively and um, just uh, the word P codes is used there. That's um, in the Syrian context. That's essentially um, it's, its geographical locations. I get the P code. So no part identified data was only presented at geographical areas. And um, the role of partners as well, as I mentioned, um, data analysis trainings were provided so that the partners themselves could utilize the information that they collected and the data they collected for 
own uh, monitoring and evaluation and their own pro programming. And this was the aspect of the initiative as well with the, the capacity building, encouraging partners um, in, in, and the use of m and &E and how um, monitoring information can be, can be used. So in terms of the data collection, I had mentioned, um, so what we had a training of trainers and the data collection tools. So um, the staff of the organizations who was responsible for training their own enumerators attended the training. It was conducted, and a lot of focus, of course, was on, you know, how to approach the questions, how to approach uh, the household, um, what to do particularly contentious or upsetting questions. You notice that in the... the when I mentioned some of the livelihood coping strategies that had gender and um, protection aspects, some of these of things, of course, are upsetting for households who are already under stress. So we did write a lot under huge stress. So a lot of um, discussion on, on how best to go about that and to collect information under those circumstances um, with people who are under stress. And um, we all went on this, then each of the the trainers basically went back to their own organizations and did um, their own enumerator trainings and most of these were done remotely because of the work in Syria that the, the field staff um, and then, then many um, staff from outside kind of go in and it's its own particular challenges which might not be um, relevant in um, other countries it's something we have to consider how that is best done and then, um, we had a feedback meeting, so the the trainers basically came back, and um, we discussed what went, what the particular issue were, et cetera, and how maybe we can um, solve some of the problems that people were having. And we did this in all of the three hubs, um, and then you support to the rollout of the data collection. So I mentioned earlier also there was a window um, uh, for the collection between September and December. So whenever organizations were doing their own data collection, they could, you know, close and ask, ask questions or, or look for support as, as essentially in real time as they were doing it. The event that we had was essentially, um, because this was a pilot exercise, and of course we were not, not uh, a bit reticent about engaging and how is it going to look like, what were the results, why are we doing this? So we weren't sure at the beginning how many partners were actually going to participate. So a conscious made um, to Basically, to ask partners to just to take the, um, the the questions or the and the questionnaire or the module and conduct it no other monitoring system or to integrate it into their own monitoring system and into their own tool. And when I say system as well, I also mean in terms of the timing that they were doing and um, kind of monitoring and so the sampling uh, strategy that they had in their own organisation. And so organization X and I had planned to uh, monitor uh, 700 households across three districts in September. Then that's what I did. I integrated the tool into that. So we harmonized with the existing data collection of, of each partner. So the advantages of this, of course, and it, which Anne consciously uh, thought about, that information can be used for the organization's own m and &E. So it maximizes the use of the information. We use it at the sector level and the organizations can use it as well. Um, we also did, you know, in terms of encouragement of um, organizations to uh, mainstream into their own uh, system. Also, uh, it's not such an additional burden then. Um, also, because of, uh, we didn't do too much to extremely busy organizations. Also, a component is the, the insistence of indicators, so uh, something that is of exit to all partners in the sector is, you know, the ability to compare information from different communities and different geographical areas and to see what's going on, or have a greater sample and, and to populate so we can learn a little bit more um, about the districts where they're working. The world building aspect, which I meant, and then of course increase accountability and the usefulness of information, which I spoke about before some of the limitations. Um, though one of the reasons why we did it that way was the uncertainty of how many people's partners would participate in the initially because people were uncertain of the process. It's a little bit different for the next phase because now people have seen the results and were willing to participate. So a different approach to something 
and maybe taken for the next round. And this is, we were aware of this at the beginning and knew that it was, the sampling strategy was something that would evolve over time. And um, not all uh, partners have monitoring systems in place. And um, so provided assistance in terms of how they would do that, so how they would sample. And so they stopped the monitoring uh, with us in this um, initiative. And not all partners are interested in all indicators for very different reasons. Um, so some guys inside Syria, they already had to have approval, maybe for one or two indicators, and didn't want to go through the whole approval process for two more this time than they do for the next round. So we're just working on livelihoods, and they were just interested, for example, in the livelihoods indicator. So that's something when it comes to sampling, just to be, to be aware of, but it still worked out well in the end. And of the data collection and sampling with the operational context and um, in terms of we, you were aware at any given time what the security situation would be the next month when we had planned the, the sampling and change all the time. The uh, partners are working on a uh, rotational mechanism. If they can't access a, a particular area for security one month, they may go to another area and then swap it the next month. So these are challenges as well just to take in mind with, with sampling. One of the reasons why we went for the, the strategy um, um, in terms of data analysis, so we provide a common platform for analysis in terms of we had a database and a server where um, we, we gave rule and people could directly download it and then send data directly to the server. Or um, if people were not using ODK or the Okay. Um, if people question us, then they could uh, we could also send around an Excel uh, template uh, just to provide a, a template for how people could actually um, enter and send us their data, and then that was consolidated at the central level. And um, I mentioned earlier, anonymity was ensured and the standard privacy protocol. And um, then, as we building and, and increased use of the of the the tool, parts were trained on. The the indicators and analysis so that they can conduct their own um, monitoring and evaluation in their own organization. We discussed as well how this information is used um, and, and casually also as well individually. So just in terms of some of the key steps, to summarize some of the key steps uh, that were involved in the of the sector level there was a partner's consult engagement. Uh, this was really key. Also, the agreement on the methodology, so how, how we approach the sampling, et cetera. The fund for a data collection. And so, window meant that as many more partners could actually participate. So, we could take as many partners as, as possible in, in that time. So, there's an element of flexibility, which is important. The trainings and the, the testing and the data collection tools. So this course for consistency. And for quality eventual, the, the, the data itself. And there's the different phases, the analysis phase, and then the reporting and the consultation. So I do have a, a draft report, and we have um, presented in, in, in two, two hubs, and consultations have been taken from that, and the report is being finalized. Um, and so some key factors from our perspective, which we thought contributed to the, the success in our specific context. I know it's, it's, it's different. And everywhere, but and um, dedication and and commitment and commitment of partners, and that kind of be one of the stated in this program and the amount of work that was done and the commitment and, and the enthusiasm as well to to work together on this. And, and of this also, I I I think the time uh, time is what was really contributed to this as well. They really put in uh, many months in terms of in total in terms of, of you know. Engage partners so that they understood the rationale, the objective process, what would be expected, and what was going to happen. Can you get closer to the mic, please? Is this better? Yes. Give me feedback. Yeah. Yes, now it's better. Thank you. I think I moved it away from my house for a second. <laughs> I have it back. Um, where, where, where should I'll just start from this slide again? Shall I? Or okay, let me just quickly just acknowledging um, the dedication and the commitment of partners.
partners and um, their enthusiasm to sort of be involved and to work together on this. So that can't be understated. And, um, and a fact is that uh, context towards that as well is that people, partners understood what the rationale and the objectives and why we were doing this uh, together. And I think the the sector, you know, dedicated time towards this. So about two months and um, it was maybe given to, you know, consultation with partners and, and, and um, you know, the whole uh, ethos of the whole um, initiative, of course, was a shared process, and then we also incorporated um, capacity building aspects. So it was a process that was both a benefit um, to the sector and to partners, and of course, ultimately, hopefully, uh, to the beneficiary as well. So, in terms of, of course, there was key elements there that contributed towards success. That was the the focus on the trainings, the data collection, the data, the, the review meetings, making sure that everyone was on the same page, doing it in Arabic, and this ultimately contributed towards the the quality of the data, which was actually quite, quite good. And um, supporting partners all the way through the process, the and the data submission, right of submission. And as I mentioned previously, there was a broad window uh, for data collection and time frame, so we could capture as much um, data as well. And it was also so key to harmonize the, the fact that it harmonized with um, partners monitoring system was another key, key a key factor. And of course, the quality we had that common platform where we, we had provided OTK tools which could be downloaded, which people could use, and we had the template as well for data submission. And the data analysis was done at central level, so all of the data cleaning and analysis, follow up with partners, it was all done from one point. So they, of course, it contributed towards the quality of the event and results. And then I dedicated a staff member to follow the process through. And of course, there's a whole team of people that are involved um, in the process, from um, you know horse to to people uh, in the partners themselves who helped us facilitate. Um, we reach involved um, in terms of the trainings for the assessment um, in Arabic, you know, um, the Syria team, the, like everybody, there was a whole team involved in it. But I think having one, a, a person, one or two people, there were two of us, of course, uh, uh, at one stage, um, to coordinate and to follow through is um, key. Also, um, really for that coordination and follow up aspect. Um, all that we do have, and we established um, a technical as well that feeds into all of this. So, from some of the the coordinators themselves and 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 key partners. And I'm going to stop there. I think I've talked quite a lot, and um, I'm going to hand over to to Adam for the way forward. So thank you so much. Thanks very. Much. I'm going to hand over the presentation to uh, Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, thank you, Andre and the Samanda and Barbara for the overview and for the outcome monitor. That's way forward. Um, we have looked at the tools and the outcome monitoring initiative is really of the operation as well as the sector bring up on the effects of the output distribution done in Syria. Yeah. And as uh, a way forward, we are updating, um, it's been updating, but I look at reviewing the tools, uh, update the also data database score to be based on the 24-hour score, which is the one in the state uh, indicator handbook, and also uh, updating the food consumption question and uh, be on the um, base of the FDSN, the guide note that it can fit into other analysis like the IPC. So it's the same approach, it's just a matter of reviewing the tools and moving forward the updated tools. And then recently had a discussion with some of our partners, particularly the nutrition sector, and we are going to do some indicators that will also inform on nutritional indicators. And this will approach the nutrition sector because the wide idea is to have more partners involved, it more so that we can have a collaborative and collective decision. And all indications in terms of food security and nutrition status uh, as the population is there. Uh, we 
we haven't noticed that we have some partners that are attending of the sector, but they are not implementing activities. They are mainly involved in the research and the assessment, and they will be part of this round, uh, participating in the data collection and also providing the sector with technical guidance when it comes to the analysis. And these partners, they are already involved in the um, technical group um, meetings and working with the sector, so they will be involved in data, in particular in locations where we don't have regular data collection. And, uh, as Anne-Marie explained, the initial round was done uh, successfully, and the sampling was mainly done by the partners. And this is something that we are working on to improve in terms of the sampling, and we are going to be basing on our outcome coverage to have on the effect location that we assisted during the period. So we want the sampling process ready for the next data collection. And the indicated earlier, we are going to bring two wheels for data collection, uh, which will be one in summer and the other one will be in winter. And the plan is there, and it will involve uh, trade partners, and then the analysis partners involved in the whole process from the beginning, and also the decision of the indicators that we are changing as indicator. And then uh, this will fit into the capacity building initiatives that we are working on. Okay, thanks very much, um, Ali Khan. I'm now going to pass the presentation over to Abir from IRD. And he's going to uh, bring us up to speed on, on the rest. Over to you, Abir. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. I'm going to present about IRD's participation in outcome monitoring. Um, of course, IRD is working in South Syria in Dara and Conetra governorates for the past three years. Uh, we contributed in the food security sector since 2013. Um, we report monthly activity achievements. Um, uh, for um, the oper Syria operation, IRD is distributing food parcels from the World Food Program and Food for Peace. Uh, we have served uh, 16 sub-districts, uh, uh, two villages, a total of 726,656 adjusted for repeated beneficiaries uh, in two governorates, uh, Zara and Knetra. Um, um, IRD has a monitoring system. Uh, it is conducted through pre- and post-distribution um, household interviews. Um, and there is also a monitoring um, that is conducted uh, through the distribution and receive a complaint from beneficiaries also to confirm that uh, the distribution is done uh, through receiving uh, GPS photos, videos, and other, other documents uh, for field volunteers. Um, distribution monitoring is also conducted uh, with the, with the households uh, who are assisted with our um, parcels uh, to check about the satisfaction um, with the with the parcel itself and with the distribution process. Uh, this monitoring is conducted through uh, our survey, our M&D survey, um, through fields, of course, M&D fields um, volunteers. Uh, we participate in the food security sector outcome monitoring. Uh, um, from from the very beginning, uh, the portion of the outcome monitoring was like through different stages. Um, a meeting were held in to discuss outcome monitoring initiatives uh, was attended by the M and D specialist, uh, volunteer communication specialist, and the program coordinator. Um, we all attended uh, trainings. Um, uh, to discuss the indicators uh, in the outcome monitoring, uh, such as the food consumption score, the household dietary diversity, and the coping strategy, uh, the consumption and livelihood coping strategy. Uh, also, specialists uh, attended the training on data collection process, um, how to uh, uh, to ask the questions, uh, how to like how to understand the questions in the survey, including some. Uh, 
uh, some questions that require to understand the local context of the food groups, the mixed dishes. Um, the, the volunteer communication specialist also and the M&A specialist uh, train the volunteer through Skype, of course, because there is no access to operational areas due to insecurity. Uh, there were four trainings that were conducted in the two governorates, um, Dara and Kanetra, because it's hard to get all the volunteers in one place uh, at the same time. So uh, that's why there were like several trainings. Um, we, the training was also done uh, for years to train them how to collect data using the food security sector ODK questionnaire. Um, so coordination, um, the communication with the field team um, to to provide the questions and the issues um, that was done through the WhatsApp messages and calls. Um, uh, how to complete uh, the responses in the ODA and like submitting the, the forms to the WFP server. Uh, we are already working with the ODK uh, in our survey, but it was like how to submit it through the, the WFP server. Uh, and to ask, how, like we train them how to ask any sensitive questions uh, while maintaining the meaning of the questionnaire because there was like several sensitive questions in the in the survey, like. Um, especially the coping strategy, um, uh, they face some difficulty asking the beneficiaries about them. So we trained them how to properly ask the beneficiaries without raising any sensitivity. Uh, we kept tracking the, uh, kept tracking, um, a tracking system for the survey submitted uh, through ODK server. It was done through daily basis. Uh, also, if they had any technical issues, we we, we like we directly contact the uh, food security sector technical team to solve the issue. Um, regarding data collection activities, um, uh, IRD participants attended uh, the data analysis training. Um, uh, the training were about how to compute indicator values, the food consumption score, uh, reduce coping strategies, index, and livelihood coping categories. Um, also, I already provided feedback on the, on the outcome monitoring process. Um, what, else, what are like the difficulties? Um, how to improve what I already would like to take for future um, as a future activity. I attended also the consolidation meeting. Uh, we had a look at the results. Um, um, that was conducted um, in the food security sector meeting. How to, how, where, where are we, and uh, what are what are the outcome monitoring risks? Um, um, IRS is considering to include some of the indicators in their regular monitoring, uh, especially the coping strategy and food consumption score. Uh, that is like because it, it it gives an indicator what are the benefits what the benefits actually need, what are um, the gaps, and, and like improve through this outcome monitoring, we can improve um, IRD's uh, assistance. Um, we IRD will continue to support the sector outcome monitoring. Uh, as I said, the results provide evidence require like in designing IRD activities. Uh, it can assess developing and improving IT activities, um, expecting annual information on feedback of beneficiaries, if we are reaching the right beneficiaries, uh, uh, what can we change to improve our assistance in Southern Syria. Um, and there, um, you, this is a map uh, to give you an idea about uh, the areas where IRD serves in both governorates, in Dara and Qanaitra, South Syria. Um, with like the food uh, assistance. Yeah. Thank you very much, Abir, and thank you to all our speakers today. Um, before we kick off our Q and A session, just a quick reminder that you are very welcome to submit any questions that you have to the speakers. You can send us these in the chat box on your webinar application. We will start now with the questions that were submitted during the presentations first. Um, 
so we have one from uh, from Damien, and I think this uh, is probably one for Bear, um, Anne Marie, and Alican. Um, given this massive undertaking that that, that this uh, this initiative really was, how much data cleaning did you have have to do? Um, well, um, uh, as for us, the data, the data that was uh, received through the WFP server, so uh, the ta data cleaning was done um, uh, from, w from WFP, the World Food Program. So we trained the uh, volunteers, and they were submitting um, the surveys to the WFP server. So we actually we didn't we didn't get the chance to see. The data like on daily basis, but of course then uh, we saw the data after the the cleaning and the analysis was done. Um, I hope this answers your question. Uh, if I get in, thank you very much, Elizabeth, for the question. Just to uh, to clarify on the uh, the server that was used, uh, it's mainly the food security sector. It's a core account that we had used. And uh, can someone mute the mic, please? The cleaning process, uh, it started with the design of the, um, the coin cobble. It had auto validation of all the responses that were there, and the skip logs were also applied in the design of the questionnaire. And that was also designed was designed in such a way that the validation was done in advance of most of the responses. So the auto validation process that was in the design of the questionnaire. And through the trainings that were conducted, we didn't do much data cleaning because once is particularly they were like close to questions and they were already coded and it didn't involve a lot of data cleaning process. The key issue was on the design template. Both in, in Excel and also in the, in the we have some partners that also use their own servers, and we share the same XLS form for those who um, are with the design of questionnaires using mobile data collection tools, and they use the same coding process. So when it comes to data cleaning process, it was mainly it wasn't that cumbersome because we are using the same platform for the data cleaning submission of the responses to the over. Thanks. Um, Marie, did you have anything to add to that as well? Or, or? No, that's fine. Um, that's, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so moving on to the next question we've got here, and this one is coming from Pushpa. Uh, I want to know, um, in terms of measuring data being expected to help program management, how did the data collection time frame affect program management of the partners? Um, potentially one for Samantha or Barbara? Or any of you want to jump in here? Uh, Samantha? So, uh, when I'm fine that when we started off with the initiative, our primary objective was to report against the Mediterranean Response Plan 2016. Um, the log frame we have on the indicators. Um, by the time uh, we were able to collect data, which was from September to December of 2016, it's um, the double benefit of being able to uh, with uh, uh, two things. One is for the, uh, the HRP 2017, uh, 2017 project submissions, where partners were able to look at their own individual organization's data to, to you know, make a, a changes that they might have needed to. And second is that a lot of partners have annual planning, uh, which starts on January. So uh, they were so able to get their own organization's label data and analysis to feed into that. Um, and also finally, we really need to, we are in the process of now finalizing the report because we would like to have this as one of our key 
evident species for this uh, conference, uh, I feel. But uh, we really want to go back to all the participating agencies to gather some feedback through, you know, through a simple uh, survey on how they were comfortably able to use uh, the, the findings to make um, adjustments in their programming. So that is something that uh, that's in the pipeline to, to, to get evidence around it on how they were able to use it. Over. Thanks very much, Samantha. We actually just had a, another question come in um, exactly about that. If there were any feedback so far from any um, program in, in terms of program activities being amended uh, or reoriented in any way because of a result of the results or the findings, but you're saying so far we 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 don't we haven't seen this, this or any evidence of this happening. Well, like I said, that you know it helped in some of our strategic um, uh, doc, you know level discussion. For instance, in the um, in the humanitarian response plan for 2017, we really stressed on dietary diversity being one of our key activities by providing access to fresh food, et cetera, for households which are receiving monthly uh, rations. So that kind of, you know, came out from, from this uh, outcome monitoring initiative, as you saw that um, uh, dietary diversity is quite uh, low. Uh, but uh, we are definitely going to collect more evidence with the partners on how they are able to act. I believe Ari has also some response to that, so I will let Anne-Marie answer the rest of it. Sam. Yeah, just to, in terms, just to add a little bit or expand to what Sam's saying on the, on the maybe more focused on the partner programming level, is some of the recommendations that we made for partners to consider or some of the things that we discussed around is, you know, given a certain amount of assistance um, was the situation deteriorating and looking beyond the, um, in certain areas and looking beyond the external factors of the conflict itself and market success. And um, some of the issues which is, is, is targeting and how's that and also rotation of programming. So as I mentioned before, sometimes um, an organization uh, may be able to also help us to expand on it. An organization may rotate their programming so they may you're far away from the microphone again. Oh. Lift this yeah, if I move my hand at all. Okay, that's <laughs> good. It's very sensitive. Okay, yeah, now. I can't move at all. Oh, okay, <laughs> I'll stay in this position. And um, so saying that there were some specific sort of program implementation questions that arose from the, the findings and also the discussions that we had in terms of targeting. And in terms of program itself, uh, rotation, rotations, and also program modalities. For example, which I mentioned earlier in the presentation about dietary diversity, etc. And looking at you know, the modalities of programming, so we investigate uh, more where cash can be um, used or complement, can complement food assistance so that people can increase dietary diversity. The external factors will allow that market-wise. So these things, in terms of they haven't been implemented yet because essentially we just, um, in terms of the timing, the, the, the data collection phase ended at the end of December. So in January, data analysis beginning, and then in February, there was the um, initial sort of presentation at the hub and the different hubs to the partners, and then we consulted, and now we're refining the, the report. So consultation meetings, these things were discussed. And partners that they were taking these issues back um, to teams to us, and of course that will happen more also when the final report is out. So it's a little bit maybe watch the space, see what happens in terms of how partners use this information. But, but in terms of feedback that we got, people were very um, um, interested in discussing these issues further and how we can best address and how they can do it individually and collectively. So that will happen, I think. We're still a bit early in the process, but that will happen now um, as we move forward. And I think there's been some initiatives that are taking place at the cluster level. I think there's also like a, a cash assessment and there's different assessments going on. And um, also these findings and these sort of points for consideration will be looked at um, in the future.
future sort of program adaptation mechanisms that are taking place. And the individual sort of organizing, maybe a beer has something to add, add or, or maybe maybe I covered it. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, we have uh, David from FSL Cluster in Turkey who would like to add something on this as well. Thank you very much. Thank you all, especially Anne Marie and Ali Khan, their great work that they did in each hub. I just want something on um, on push question and the last question because it was uh, interesting that uh, when uh, Anne Marie and Ali Khan came for the preliminary data discussion in our cluster meeting, we have uh, we had also. Uh, uh, a meeting on uh, the new HPF, which is the Humanitarian Pool Fund uh, priority discussion within the cluster. So it's an interesting coincidence to see the preliminary data from the from monitoring initiative and uh, and have this kind of discussion on, on uh, activities prioritization of the Humanitarian Pool Fund. Uh, what we normally do is uh, we input the the advisory board of the pool fund uh, from uh, what we think as cluster have been the priorities in terms of area of operation, of, of, uh, of uh, vulnerable people and activities themselves. So that was very, very interesting to have uh, both in the same day. And I remember that there were a lot of people, around 50, 60 people. And I remember especially Alikan was quite scared. <laughs> and kidding, of course. Uh, so, so that was a nice example also to make use uh, directly with this uh, of the preliminary uh, results of the assessment. I should also highlight the fact that uh, the positive impact of this was also on the capacity building side, with all the session that uh, Anne Marie uh, um, has shared. We, I think that. Uh, we had a very positive uh, uh, outcome in terms of uh, partners' participation. I think that on our side, 10 or 10 uh, uh, members participated to the initiative. And, uh, but also, uh, in any case, it will be a deal, an impact for the, for the entire group of, uh, of the cluster here, and I think at full serial level as well. Thank you. Thanks. Very much David for for this. Um, we are moving on to a couple of questions more, looking into the methodology of uh, of this initiative. Um, a question here from Nayamsi, to probably directed more towards uh, Marie and 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 Alikan and Abir, uh, who's interested in knowing a bit more about the sam sampling design um, and how the sample size was determined and also Matthias Mullet would like to know what was specific what was the share of farming households in the sample so Marie Alikan and 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 up there maybe I'll start the Alikan can add on and um, the beer also uh, I'll just maybe start and talk about the the initial um approach to the sampling that i mentioned during the presentation which was partners um, to sample based on their own monitoring plans so we want to add an additional round of monitoring to partners we didn't want to add a, an additional burden and um, so we them to integrate into the, their own monitoring system and a sampling strategy or design that they had to utilize that for this particular round because we wanted to see how things would, would go and how onerous it was for people to add in these questions. So if, so if I'm organization X and I sampled uh, whatever percentage of my population beneficiaries in, in whatever geographical areas and my monitoring plan was to do whatever for that particular sampling round, they just made it into whatever it was we're doing. So it was totally harmonized. If it did not have uh, a monitoring system, we helped them look at what would be representative uh, of beneficiary population and what was feasible you know, for that particular round of data collection. So 
it was all based on uh, what parties were doing themselves, and then by, by default becoming representative of something that is bigger than the individual party. And um, the end of that will be uh, one of the limitations uh, limitation in design sampling strategies from the outset, something like this, is that we don't know exactly how many parties will um, participate. Some joined in at the end. Some are thinking about it. I must go closer to Oh, I moved again. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Is that okay? So I'm back in my original position. So um, for the for the next phase, now that we know um, how many partners maybe will continue with us, and that we have other partners saying that they would like to participate in the next round, and we can look at the we can now and design more an overall uh, sampling strategy for the initiative itself and being representative. Right now, the issue that we had we achieved, we we sort of idea that this would happen. Um, was a government level and working to see if we can get to lower geographical to get our representative at lower geographical areas. More partners will come on board and help us to sort of populate these these areas so that we can get more more data. I don't know about Han um, if you'd like to add something at this point. I think you've covered uh, almost everything. Uh, moving forward we um as we have partners in the data collection and also on key food indicators, um, we have a representative sample uh, which will be based on our coverage from the first quarter. So we will be using statistically valid representative sample for the data collection. And the coverage is going to be improving since we have, as I said at the beginning, we also have data doing assessments and research inside Syria and going to be supporting us in terms of data collection. And then the question concerning what is the proportion of farmers that participated in the interviews. Uh, with that question, our main focus was on uh, beneficiaries. And since we're following up on the effects of sector activities to households, but in, coming, in the coming round, since we are getting this request from partners, because some also uh, to see if they can have an analysis of how uh, many households are benefiting from life-based activities. Food activities, including farmers. This will be as a key question that we can also use during the analysis and cross application process. Over. Thank you very much for that, Alec. And per perhaps following on uh, from that, I have another question from Mark uh, Petzold, who is interested in knowing specifically if you measured. Also, the impact of multiple force displacement on food security outcomes, and if you have data on different strata, for example, households that have been displaced um, for several times and so on. Uh, Mark, can you ask Anne-Marie or Alikan on this question? I mean, the, through the way it was designed, we were looking at the status of the respondents in terms of uh, if they were from the wind is displaced, uh, in terms of being displaced, and the nature of the displacement. So, the analysis is available when the cross tabulation is available. And so, this will also be included in the next round because it's important for us to look at the effect of food assistance. These are the displacement status in the moment time. The, also being displaced, so that analysis is available because we looked at the status of the household in terms of the potential status. Over. Okay, great, Alihan. Anyone else wanted to add anything on this? Any of the other speakers? Okay. Um, perhaps another question, uh, also related to this, but zooming out a little bit, um, based on the experience from this uh, undertaking. What feel um, overall could be done to increase the quality of data sets in emergency and uh, hard to reach areas that are supported by the sector? So over to Amory or Alika on this. Thank you so much, Sarkhan. 
Thank you much, Anna Mary. I think the I mean the key word if I got your question is on uh data quality in emergence in that range. And something that applies to the context we are working in Syria where we don't have direct access to most patients and we rely on uh humans that are already in the field. So capacity building will be important not only for sector partners. But if uh, human readers that are working inside and also working in, in collaboration with the uh, organization so that they understand which indicators are being monitored by the sector. And I, I have to refer uh, the audience to the sector core handbook, which, which has the indicators and the guidance in terms of how they are supposed to be measured. If people are supposed to be sensitive to all that, participate in sector meetings and they have to understand how these indicators are important when it comes to to measurements of effects of, of activities. So cap building on things and also ensure that the validation process is done as a course process from the beginning when you design the data collection tools and also to ensure that the data management systems like database have to be strong and to ensure um, uh, validation of the responses they come over. Sorry, can I just add something? This is Samantha. Thanks. Uh, I mean, Akan has very, uh, you know, articulated very well on on the steps taken for the, to maintain the quality of data. But I'd also like to highlight that if uh, if any other sector or cluster in any other uh, Country, uh, wishes to undertake an exercise such as this, uh, there is a need for dedicated technical people within the sector secretariat, uh, professionals or experienced technical experts that understand, uh, um, you know, food security outcomes, monitor exercises, uh, questions, the, the various technical issues around it because um, it took and Maria Alican close to six to seven months to come to this uh, to this uh, output uh, where we have the data analysis and the report is being published. And this was a pilot um, activity under the sector. Uh, and uh, coordinators and information management officers are mostly overwhelmed with a lot of other tasks. So something that I would like to pitch uh, to Global Food Security Cluster as well, uh, that you know that in a in a cluster team or sector team, it is very important to maintain such a technical expert if um, a massive enterprise like this needs to be taken and sustained. Over. For for this Samantha and, and good, good advice there in terms of the capacity and skills that are are needed to to facilitate facilitate something um, as, as massive as this assessment indeed has been. Uh, I think we've reached the end of the questions. Unless there are any final comments from any of the speakers or any of the participants. No. Okay, well then I will thank everyone for participating in this webinar, presenting the whole of Syria Food Security Sector Outcome Monitoring Initiative. It has recorded, and both the recording and the presentation will be posted on the Food Security Cluster website. And I believe the link, yes, Michelle has just posted the link here on the chat where you can access um, all the, the materials. So thanks then everybody for having joined us today. Uh, goodbye.